Paul is on his second missionary journey, and he leaves, as we saw last week, the city of Athens. And he comes now in verse 1 to the city of Corinth. He leaves the philosophical and kind of one of the academic centers of the ancient world in Athens. And when he comes to Corinth, he comes to a city with an entirely different vibe. And uh, Athens, being a philosophical center, is kind of like many portions of the educational centers today where um, you can be in a bubble in some sections of it, the philosophy areas and all, and you can take and, you know, wax philosophical about life and have all kinds of ideas about experimenting and what is truth and all that kind of stuff. And as long as you live in a place that has a government that's wealthy enough to... Um, supply you with places to live in the theoretical realm, you're fine. But there's a very real world out there outside of some of those bubbles, and Corinth was one of those real worlds. Corinth was a commercial center for the Roman Empire. Virtually all east-west traffic of trade uh, went through Corinth uh, because of the canal that had been cut through that particular area, and so it was a rough and tumble place. It was a business center. It was like, what have you done for me lately? They knew how to make money. They knew how to work hard. And if you weren't going to work hard and keep up, then get out of my way. And as is kind of the case where something's driven that way, um, that kind of person so often, and Corinth certainly knew, they knew how to work hard and they knew how to party hard. And they, and they did. And they, it was a pleasure center uh, for the Roman Empire. So they'd work hard in their jobs and all. And then when they got off, uh, all kinds of things were out there for them to engage in, uh, in their flesh. And so after these things, Paul departed from Athens and they went to Corinth. And he found a certain Jew named Aquila, born in Pontus, who had recently come uh, from Italy with his wife Priscilla, because Claudius had commanded all the Jews to depart from Rome, and Paul came to them. So there was persecution against Jews, and uh, Aquila and Priscilla at this time uh, probably already knew the Lord before they came into contact with Paul. If they didn't, they came to know the Lord through Paul almost immediately as a result of, of getting in contact with one another in Corinth. But it does seem likely that they already had a relationship with the Lord. And so, because Paul was, <clears throat> because Aquila, he was of the same trade, Paul stayed with them and worked, for by occupation they were tent makers. And uh, so uh, Paul, uh, having this in common, they both made tents. Uh, Jewish uh, fathers were very particular about their boys, especially if they were studying theology. Uh, it can be like a lot of areas of ministry where it's, I'm glad you know all those things and all, but somehow you've got to eat and keep a roof over your head. And, and so, uh, you know, traveling Jewish teachers and all, unless you could get in some place, you typically needed to have a side job that was of some practical worth in this fallen world to support yourself and then be your uh, religious teacher around that. The Jewish um, fathers had a saying about their sons, and that is, if you don't teach them a trade, you teach them to steal. And so they always taught their boys a trade. And uh, Paul's father, evidently, for all of the great religious education Paul had, he made sure that he had a trade that he could earn a living from, and that was tent making. He and Aquila hit it off because they both shared uh, the same occupation as tent makers. And Paul, while he was in Corinth, he reasoned, 
in the synagogue every Sabbath and persuaded both Jews and Greek. And so the Greeks. So Paul goes, as is his custom, into the synagogues. And notice he just doesn't kind of throw the gospel out and, and, you know, say that the predestined are going to get it and the rest aren't. He is after their will. He reasons with them. He persuades as if that makes a difference in what, what, he's, what he's doing here, both Jews and Greeks. Explaining, as we've seen in recent weeks, there is a reason to be a Christian. It is the only reasonable thing to do and be in this world in light of the prophecies of the Old Testament concerning the Messiah who was to come and Jesus is the fulfillment of those prophecies. Paul just went from city to city and brought out these same things appealing to the will and the minds of people and uh, knew if he had that, everything else was going to follow. And when Silas and Timothy had come from Macedonia... Paul was compelled by the Spirit and testified to the Jews that Jesus is the Christ. And so when they came in, he was in, alone in the city for a time. When his fellow workers came in, he really kind of got down to brass tacks and he really made it very, very clear testifying to Jesus as the Christ. But when they opposed him and blasphemed, he shook his garments and said to them, Your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. For now on, from now on, I will go to the Gentiles. So you can imagine Paul as the opposition occurs there in the synagogue, and he just takes his robes and he kind of, you know, takes all of the dust and, and uh, flips them off of his, his garment kind of as, as a gesture uh, to them. And uh, in essence says, I'm, I'm uh, done with you. Now, it wasn't a thing of Paul going, uh, listen, you guys are a bunch of numbskulls and I'm the smart guy. And if you don't get it, then I'm out of here. That's not what's happening here. What you have is kind of a variation of when Jesus spoke and he declared in Matthew 10, and whoever will not receive you nor hear your words when you depart from that house or city, Shake the dust off your feet. And again, the shaking of my dust, the dust off of my feet from a house where someone is rejecting the message that God has called us to bring to mankind isn't a a, a condescending thing. It is to say, I don't want to take anything from you. I don't even want to take one speck of dust from you to ease your conscience in the rejection of this message that your eternal destination is kind of weighed on. Uh, That Sometimes there's a kind of person that if, you know, you leave their house or you leave away from them and they're able to give you, you know, uh, some groceries and a few bananas and uh, this and a coupon to In-N-Out Burger or whatever, they feel like their conscience has kind of been eased a little bit. And so Paul says, listen, I don't want to take anything from you. I leave you alone with that message, the conviction of the message, and I don't want to confuse it by taking any gift from you, even the dust from your house. And, uh, and so he walks away from it to make the sobriety, just making it very understandable to them how serious their rejection of the gospel is. Now, he says to them, your blood be upon your own heads. I am clean. The Apostle Paul, when he wrote to the Romans, he declared in Romans chapter 1, I am a debtor both to Greeks and to barbarians, both to wise and to unwise. The Apostle Paul had an attitude in his heart that I think is a healthy one for all of us as Christians. He always considered himself a debtor to his fellow man for having heard the gospel in his own life, Someone having brought that gospel to him, having had the privilege of responding to that gospel, he considered it now his personal responsibility for the rest of his life to deliver that same message to others that hadn't heard the message yet for the rest of his life. Now, in the book of Ezekiel, God warned Ezekiel not to go silent related to the message. 
And God told Ezekiel, listen, you've got watchmen on your wall there. And if the enemy's coming and destruction is coming on a city and the watchman sees the danger and he's silent, then the blood of the people that die in the slaughter is on the watchman. But if the watchman sees the danger and warns the population of the danger that's coming, and then they do nothing in it to, to respond to the warning, then their blood is on their own head. Now, that, kind, that whole thing can be used to really put you, a, a person under a lot of guilt, you know. And listen, if you don't let everybody know, then their blood is on your head. I don't think there's a person in this room that's strong enough to carry that. That's, that's outside of our realm. And Paul didn't carry this message and declare this message to Jew and Gentile in all these cities that he went into out of guilt or out of condemnation. He carried it out of love. He said, the love of Christ constrains me. And that was his motivation. But he went in and he said, listen, knowing what I know, knowing what I know about eternity, knowing what I know about this gospel, knowing all these things that I know, I am no longer free to keep this to myself when there's a whole world that's waiting to hear it. And so he considered himself that kind of a debtor. And when he had delivered the message in his thinking, I'm clean of your responsibility. The responsibility had been placed completely upon them. He said, I can walk away from this with a clear conscience. From now on, I go to the Gentiles. He says, I'm going to go on to those that want to hear. And there are times where a person, you witness and you witness and you witness. We're always open to the leading of the Holy Spirit in witnessing to people because sometimes there can be a season and it backs off and then another season where God brings you back into the situation. But not where all of my time is being lost to people or a person that isn't interested in hearing but to go on now and speak to those who haven't heard and will be li- willing to listen. And he departed from there and entered the house of a certain man by the name of Justice, who was uh, one who worshipped God, whose house was next door to the synagogue. So he didn't have to go too far. He went right next door. Justice being a Gentile, being a god fear. And and his home probably shared a common wall with the synagogue. And Paul just went in next door and continued his ministry there. And Crispus, we're told, the ruler of the synagogue, believed on the Lord with all of his household. And, And so Crispus... We recognize from Paul's letter to the Corinthians and later when he writes 1 Corinthians and he said, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, lest anyone should say that I had baptized in my own name. Yes, I also baptized the household of Stephanus. Besides, I do not know whether I baptized any others. And so here is Crispus, the ruler of the synagogue. Now, that doesn't mean that He was kind of the spiritual leader of the synagogue. The ruler of the synagogue was kind of like the head deacon. He made sure that the word was where it was, the scrolls, and that everything was ready for the service. He kind of ran the order of the service. And uh, so, But he listens to Paul, and he believes on the Lord Jesus and his entire household. And many of the Corinthians, hearing, they believed, and they were baptized. Now the Lord spoke to Paul in the night by a vision. And here's what the Lord said to Paul in the vision there in Corinth. God said, do not be afraid. Now why would God say don't be afraid? Unless we're afraid. <laughs> Sometimes Paul, he's, he's, he's so high, you know, in, in my thinking and somebody who's so high above uh, you know, me and all. I begin to think of him as one that's kind of impervious to this kind of emotion. God comes to him and says, Paul, don't be afraid. Why? Because Paul was afraid. So Paul's close enough to touch again in, in all of this. Why is Paul afraid? Because of the pattern that had characterized his ministry in all the cities where good things had happened. <laughs> Every time significant people got saved and large groups of Jew and Gentiles got saved, Paul looked at it and go, could say to himself, now somewhere in here, I get a good beating. <laughs> and he's got to be thinking that. 
Now, you know, it's a, it, is, it is one thing to read the Bible. And in, in my devotional time in the morning, I'll typically have a cup of tea and maybe a couple of pieces of toast with it. And everything. It's one thing to read about a beating in that, in that environment. It's another thing to be beaten continually. It's another thing to be stoned to the point of death. And, and when that's happened to you continually, you're not, it, it's not something like, you know, I'm big enough, I can take this kind of thing and bring on the stones, you know, or bring on the next beating or that. You, you know, you're kind of like, um, I'd rather not uh, do that again. <laughs> so, so he's afraid. Now, it's interesting. He's afraid in his ministry. He's afraid at a time of tremendous blessing. And tremendous blessing, times in ministry, where God is blessing tremendously, they have their own sources of fear for the person that God is using. There's a fear of, you know, who am I to be doing this? What happens if it all blows up? Or what happens if this and all this kind of stuff? Or all these kinds of things. And so, but Paul is... He, he's afraid here, and apparently the fear, as we're going to see in just half a sentence here, is, is tempting him to make a wrong decision. And the wrong decision is, is to leave, or to leave Corinth prematurely. Prematurely being 18 months sooner than God wants him to leave. That's why the Bible says the fear of man is a snare. It's a trap. God does not use fear and condemnation to lead his people, including ministers. God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power, love, and a sound mind. There is now, therefore, no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. This is, this is right. It's going to cave in. Don't be afraid. <laughs> but this, the fear, even for the strongest of saints, we can be susceptible to it. Even when we're on top of the world, when the rest of the world looks and says, man, that person wouldn't have anything to be afraid of. And, and so maybe you're here tonight. And that's where you are in your ministry. You're afraid of what it is that, uh, that is the situation that you're in and all. Never let fear drive you. God doesn't use it. He leads by His Word. He leads by His Spirit. He leads by His peace. Let the peace of God rule or umpire in your heart, he wrote to Colossians. So, do not be afraid, to, but speak, and do not keep silent. The great tragedy is God looked at, at Paul in, in his fear was that he'd go silent. That he'd go silent. It's interesting how casually as Christians we can view going silent as a Christian. Just buttoning up and letting weeks and months and years kind of roll on silently. God comes in in a vision to Paul and says, don't be afraid and don't stop talking. I'm in this. I'm working. For I am with you. Don't be afraid. Give me one good reason. All right. One reason and one alone. But it's the biggie. For I am with you and no one will attack you to hurt you. For I have many people in this city. <laughs> Well, you're thinking about getting out of here. Well, you don't know, as I have a lot of people that are going to get saved in this city. Corinth was, by reputation, the single most wicked city in the entire Roman Empire. It was known for sexual immorality. It was known for drunkenness. A Corinthian, we're told from historical sources, was never portrayed... On the Roman stage, Roman theater, but that he was immoral and he was a drunk. That was the reputation of, of, the, entire, of uh, uh, the entire city. When Paul wrote the book of Romans and those first three chapters, which are damning chapters as it relates to just this relentless look at who and what we are in Adam, fallen from God, when he writes those chapters, and I don't know how long ago it's been since you've read those chapters, but I mean, you can wilt under the strength of the description in those chapters there. He wrote them from Corinth. Paul didn't go, now let's see, what will be weighty here or anything? He didn't do that anyway because he was inspired by the Holy Spirit. 
But all he had to do was open the front door of his house and look out at Corinth and just wrote write down what he saw. Just in the everyday interaction of, of the people. And so God says as it relates to this group of, of people, he said, I have many people in this city. <laughs> many people in this city. They ought to lick our chops. When we look at the most wicked city in the United States, or the most wicked neighborhood, or the most wicked what, Jesus said to the church at Laodicea, it was lukewarm. And he said to them, he said, I would that you were hot or cold. But he said, because you're lukewarm, I'll spew you out of my mouth. He had more hope. He desired that, that people would be red hot for him. But he desired ice coldness toward him over lukewarmness. Because a, a lukewarm person, kind of a religious kind of a deal, that's the hardest person to get through. Paul comes in. God says, look, I know what it looks like. It looks wicked to you. But I've got a lot of people that are going to get saved here. And by the way, I'm going to protect you in all of this. And so what did, the, what did Paul do? He continued there for a year and six months teaching the word of God among them. He spent 18 months in Corinth. The only city that he spent a longer period of time in was the city of Ephesus, where he stayed for three years. Corinth was the second longest period that he had spent in any city, and an outstanding, though a troubled church, but an outstanding church was planted as a result of this time. And then uh, Galileo was pro when he was pro of Achaia. He's a Roman ruler there in that region. The Jews, with one accord, rose up against Paul, and they brought him to the judgment seat there in Corinth. And their accusation that they brought against Paul was this fellow persuades men to worship God contrary to the law. Not the law of of Rome, but the law of Moses. And when Paul was about to open his mouth to defend himself, remember God said, I'm going to take care of you. But he's he's getting ready now to, to defend himself this pro council said to the Jews, if it were a matter of wrongdoing or wicked crimes, O Jews, there would be reason why I should bear with you. But if it's a question of words and names and your own law, look to it yourselves, for I do not want to be judge of such matters. And he drove them from the judgment seat, probably drove them away by order. He called his kind of the bailiffs there in the courtroom and said, you know, kind of get them out of here. And we're told that then all the Greeks took Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, uh, uh, replacing Crispus. And he is apparently the guy that has come in and he's laid these accusations against Paul. He's the prosecuting attorney in this thing. And so when the Greeks took Sosthenes, the ruler of the synagogue, they beat him before the judgment seat. But the pro took no notice of these things. Now, it is interesting because when Paul again writes in 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verses 1 and 2, writes back to this church, Paul declares, Paul an apostle, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and Sosthenes, our brother. <laughs> so somehow he takes this beating and uh, maybe finds out what it's like to take a beating, And uh, he gets revelation concerning the gospel, but he apparently now becomes a believer and becomes one who travels ultimately with the Apostle Paul. And so Paul remained a good while in, in Corinth, and he took leave of the brethren, and he sailed for Syria, and Priscilla and Aquila were with him traveling from uh, Corinth. He had his hair cut off at that place, for he had taken a vow. And he came to the city of Ephesus. This is his first contact with the city of Ephesus. And he left Priscilla and Aquila there, but he himself entered into the synagogue, reasoned with the Jews, and when they asked him to stay a longer time with them, he didn't consent to, but he took leave of them, saying, I must by all means keep this coming feast in Jerusalem. He's in a hurry to get back to Jerusalem to keep one of the three great feasts of the Jewish religious calendar. Uh, Evidently, uh, wanting to go there to be a witness and a testimony uh, for the Lord there. But then he said, but I will return again to you 
God willing, and he sailed from Ephesus. And God was willing, and he ends up in Ephesus for a significant length of time on his third missionary journey. And when he had landed at Caesarea, the Roman port of Caesarea there in Israel, and had gone up, that is to go up to Jerusalem. Jerusalem was always spoken of as going up to Jerusalem because as you approach Jerusalem, you're always uh, uh, ascending because it's on a mountain, Mount Zion. And so Jerusalem, you always go up to Jerusalem. And whenever you leave Jerusalem, you always go down then to the city that you're going to. And so when he had gone up, and greeted the church there in Jerusalem, he went down to Antioch. And and thus ends his second missionary journey. It ends kind of quietly as it relates to chapter breaks and and all of this. He comes back now to the city of Antioch, which had sent him with Silas on on this missionary journey. And uh, and it comes back located there uh, on the Mediterranean Sea in what is modern-day Syria. And, uh, and so he, he returns, probably been gone for two to three years on this missionary journey. And after he had spent some time there, he departed and went over to the region of Galatia and Pergia in order, strengthening all the disciples. Paul couldn't stay in one place uh, too long. He was always wanting to be on the move and, and, uh, and busy about the things of the Lord. And he had that missionary call upon his life. And so he heads out, and and verse 23 is the start of his third missionary journey. And so he goes out into that region, strengthening the region of modern-day Turkey, strengthening all the disciples, cities that he had been to before. Now, a certain Jew named Apollos, born in Alexandria, an eloquent man and mighty in the Scriptures, came to Ephesus. And this man had been instructed in the way of the Lord, and being fervent in spirit, he spoke and taught accurately the things of the Lord, though he knew only the baptism of John. And so he began to speak boldly in the synagogue there in the city of Ephesus. And uh, Priscilla and Aquila, Paul has left them there. And, uh, and so we're introduced now to this man by the name of Apollos. And that's quite a name, isn't it? Apollos. I mean, not, not just from the Rocky movies or wherever, you know, you hear this thing. But I mean, pa- Apollos, that's a name to live up to, apparently. But this guy was a remarkable, remarkable man. And you notice the description. He's a Jew. He's familiar with the things of the Jews. He's described as being born in Alexandria. Alexandria was the second largest city of the Roman Empire. It had replaced Athens as the educational center for the Roman Empire. It was the place, the greatest place to get a education in Grecian culture and in, in, in Grecian ways. So he comes from Alexandria. He is steeped not only in the things of the Jews, he's steeped in the things of the Gentiles. And so tremendously educated in every way you can be educated. But on top of that, notice that he's an eloquent man. I mean, a person can be tremendously educated and have no capacity to communicate it. (laughs) That's very sad. I've had teachers like that in, in school. I mean, they know so much, but there just isn't that. They can't get the thing out in a way that connects. So when you have tremendous learning with an ability and more than an ability and an eloquence, we're talking about an artist here, the ability to communicate what he knows, you've got quite a package. And then notice what's added to the package. Not only is he eloquent, but he's mighty in the scriptures. This is a guy that not only knows all those things, he knows the Scriptures, and he's got a great theme to preach. The greatest themes that any human being can give their life to, to preaching and declaring. And this man understands those themes. He's mighty in the Scriptures. And then you notice in verse 25 we're told that as he he was the fervent in spirit. He's a man who had passion. Now you put a... That's a package. I mean, there's a pulpit search guy for you. I mean, a line would form for a fellow like that. 
That is quite a, 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 that's a tremendously talented and gifted man. In other words, what God is saying in essence is this guy's off the graph. He's off the graph. I, you, I mean, I don't know how many people you know like that. Apparently none. But I mean, uh, I wasn't fishing, by the way. I know better than to do that. So he's, he's in the synagogue, and, and he's speaking there. He begins, verse 26, so he began to speak boldly in the synagogue. But all he knows is the baptism of, of John the Baptist. So being a disciple of John the Baptist, it's evident that he, uh, he uh, probably knows that Jesus is the Messiah. He, he knows that... Um, uh, John had said, you know, behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And, and, he, and he knows all of these things. But he just kind of has, has a message of, you know, repentance. He doesn't have, he doesn't have the whole picture of, of, you know, what Jesus has come, what he's done, the impact of it. His, his theology still needs to be developed a, a little bit. And so he's speaking boldly in the synagogue. And when Aquila and Priscilla heard him... Uh, they took him aside and explained to him the way of God more accurately. They, they listened. They came in to the church service there in the synagogue, and they listened to him. And uh, instead of heading down to the hometown buffet and laughing at that, uh, that eloquent speaker that didn't know what he was talking about and having roast preacher for lunch that day, they looked and they said, this, this fellow's gifted. This fellow's called. But he just needs to be discipled a little bit in the message and to understand more fully the message. And they had the privilege of being with Paul. Apollos didn't have that privilege yet. So they didn't look and just say, well, he's a dummy and we're smart. And God gave them a stewardship for what they knew. And so they and I like it. They took him aside. They didn't interrupt the service and say, hey, you big dummy. They took him aside privately and then then they didn't yell at him. Or they didn't condescend to him, you know what I mean, or speak condescendingly to him. They took and they explained things to him. They explained the way of God uh, a little uh, uh, more accurately. And so they just took him aside, started to tell him some of the areas of Christian doctrine that he was unfamiliar with, and, and uh, including baptism in the name of Jesus and all that that represented. And when he desired to cross uh, to Achaia, the brethren wrote exhorting the disciples to receive him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who had believed through grace, for he vigorously refuted the Jews publicly, showing from the Scriptures that Jesus is the Christ. Now, Paul, uh, I mean, Apollos leaves uh, Ephesus and he heads to Corinth. Because remember, they kind of got into that carnal thing at Corinth. I'm of Paul, I'm of Apollos, and all. And, and Corinth really liked orators. And so he, they kind of got a group that said, you know, boy, uh, uh, you know, Apollos ought to be the pastor. And, you know, this ought to be. And that, and that whole game that was going on, it was a mark of, of their carnality in Corinth. But Apollos goes there uh, to that city, and, and he is uh, recommended by... Uh, the disciples there in Ephesus to go there and they're able to say, hey, listen, this guy's a good guy. Uh, give him an opportunity to speak and, and to use him. Now, the interesting thing to me, and I think one of the reasons that God brings this whole incident of Apollos out at this, at this particular point in, in the whole situation is that Apollos teaches us that it doesn't matter how talented a person is. It doesn't matter how gifted a person is. It doesn't matter how eloquent a person is. It doesn't matter how educated a person is. Every single one of us need to be teachable. And promotion in the body of Christ is very often determined by an individual's willingness to remain teachable in their ministry. Apollos could have said, listen, what do you know? I am a graduate of Alexandria. Who are you? You tent makers going to tell me? He doesn't do it. 
I'm eloquent. I can get a crowd faster than any of you tent makers and on. You're going to tell me. There's none of that in his heart. He's teachable. And he's a man for all that he knows and all of his gifts. He's a man who wants to continue to grow and to learn. There's a lot of people who, and we have to be careful of it. Well, those that are in that category have to be careful of it to begin to lean on all of these things and cease to grow. There's no growth for one year and five years and ten years. And then all of a sudden, the brethren aren't able to recommend them for promotion, to go over and to be used in another place. And then they get bitter and upset and they, and they don't it, it, over the whole thing. And what they don't realize is they've ceased to grow. And having all of this kind of ability and talent and gifting is no excuse not to continue to grow. So he was teachable. And I'll tell you, for every single one of us in the body of Christ, where we end up in terms of effectiveness and our service to the Lord will very much be determined by how teachable we are on top of God's gifting and His calling. And so they took him aside and he was then allowed to come in into the uh, goes into uh, Corinth and is greatly used by the Lord there. I'm going to stop. There's too much in chapter 19 to go into.